Hello, and welcome to another lecture of 6837. Today, we're going to continue our discussion of computer graphics, but move into a series of lectures that essentially are covering important topics in graphics, but ones that we're only going to be able to cover for one lecture at a time. Uh, to get those started, we're going to talk about color uh, and perception in your eye. Our plan for today is to give an entirely inadequate description of what goes on in a human visual system and how color goes from a light source all the way to your eye. Uh, along the way, we'll talk about spectra of light. We'll talk about the spectral response that happens in your eye, color matching procedures so that we can standardize colors across different displays. And finally, one perceptual and kind of computational trick for storing intensities uh, known as gamma. Uh, which is typically used in image formats today. So here's one thing that we've pretty much neglected in 6837, but is incredibly, incredibly important. And that's the fact that at the end of the day, we're producing images that are composed of colors and light drawn from the visible spectrum of light. Now, I am neither an anatomist nor am I a physicist, so today we're going to do a lot of things very inaccurately just to give you guys some kind of a rough idea of what's going on when we talk about uh, color perception and how it affects our design of displays, capture devices, and so on. But in any event, most of what we talked about in our computer graphics course really pr involves producing uh, light, which is sitting in a very tiny piece of the electromagnetic spectrum. And that part of the spectrum is known as the visible spectrum of light. It's roughly, what, about 400 to 700 nanometers when it comes to uh, wavelength. Of course, there's nothing stopping rendering technology from being applied to, I don't know, gamma rays or x-rays or radio waves. And of course, there are probably some scientific applications that could benefit from that. But typically, when we talk about generating visual content, we're really focused on that visible spectrum of light. So when we talk about light from an extremely rough perspective, what we're talking about is its spectrum. Now, at least abstractly, we can think of the spectrum of light as kind of like this plot that we see on the slide here. The basic idea is that really light is a composition of many different wavelengths. Very rarely do we see a light source that's one pure wavelength isolated among all the others. So instead, we think of light kind of like this distribution uh, over different wavelengths. So what does that mean? That means that in order to describe uh, an electromagnetic signal, what we need is actually an entire plot worth of values, um, kind of like a function where for every single wavelength, we get some relative energy value, which tells you how much of that wavelength is present in a particular light source. The same thing goes for the color that gets reflected off of an object. You can think of that as sort of like uh, you know, a light source, but of course the challenge and one that we're going to address today is that that color interacts with the color of the light bulb in order to produce the image that goes into your eye. So here's some examples. So here's the uh, <laughs> spectral power distribution for a box of crayons. And if we think about this plot too hard, it starts to become really, really complicated. In fact, I would argue it's complicated just looking at it to begin with. But really, the question is, what do these curves represent? Um, and the reason that I think it's worth thinking about this for a minute is that, of course, if I have a red crayon, it looks very different in nice, happy, outdoor sunlight environment than it does in the dark, than it does with a neon green light flashing on it. So it's not that a crayon somehow produces a particular color, and that's what we see in this plot, but rather this is the spectral response of that particular material uh, to a light source. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So the first question that we're going to try and answer, which of course is somehow a really deep one philosophically and one that we could talk about for years, uh, but you know, we get about five minutes and like a <laughs> photograph of a kid in kind of a very 1980s outfit here <laughs> to uh, describe. Uh, 
<clears throat> and the question that we're going to answer or attempt to answer is what is color? Now, in reality, I'm not going to answer this, but rather I'm going to answer what do we perceive as color? So let's say that we're holding up an apple, like this guy. I really like his uh, <laughs> his necklace. I should update these slides, but I'm, I'm entertained. In any event, let's say that we're looking at the apple that he's holding in his hand. The question is, when we see a red apple, what is that red coming from? What are we really perceiving? So if we dig into it, there's a lot of different ingredients that go into the color that we see. To start out with, you know, if we trace the light coming into our eye all the way back to its source, you know, the apple, maybe this guy uh, <laughs> with the slick back hair is standing outdoors with his apple. Uh, so the first uh, thing that we have to worry about is the spectral power distribution of the light, right? These are the colors that are present in the light source itself because those are the only things that can get reflected back to my eye. Next up, there's the color of the apple itself. This is a red apple. So this particular apple uh, comes with its own uh, reflectance spectrum, which essentially is telling us that it's happy to reflect red light toward my eye and more likely to absorb other species of light far away from that piece of the spectrum. So what happens when the light comes into my eye? Well, essentially, all we do is we take the spectral power distribution of the light source, the reflectance spectrum of the apple in this case, and just multiply them together. And that's roughly the color that ends up being reflected off of that surface and into my eyeball. So <clears throat> what does it mean when the apple looks like a different color under a different light source? For example, let's say I take that sun and I replace it with a neon lamp. So now it's kind of bluish. <laughs> well, the apple itself didn't change, right? So the uh, reflectance spectrum over here remained the same, but now it gets multiplied against a different function. And so that's why color perception involves both the environment as well as the material that I'm looking at all getting multiplied together. In this case, to get a kind of spiky uh, power distribution, which is pretty typical for a, a neon lamp. Okay, so, right. Unfortunately, we're still missing one ingredient in our story here. <laughs> so we've talked about the light coming onto the surface of the apple and the fact that the material of the apple can absorb or reflect off light and that that's really a function of wavelength. Those two things get multiplied together and that is sort of the remaining light that comes from the light source, bounces off the apple and goes toward you. But there's the third player in this game, in addition to this guy with the uh, mafia necklace. In particular, there's the observer, Harry Potter, apparently. <laughs> uh, so what goes on? Well, the light that bounces off of the apple goes toward the observer's eye and creates a stimulus for the sensors in the inside of this person's eye. And so really, when we talk about color, it's the interplay between a lot of different actors in this very complicated scene, right? On the one hand, there's the light source. On another hand, there's the material of the apple itself. And then finally, even though we have this very complicated spectrum of light that comes into the eye, we also need to figure out how sensitive the eye itself is to that spectrum in order to figure out what is perceived as colors. And those are all the different players in the game. So really, when we talk about computer graphics technology, in some sense, our main client is the eyeball. And, uh, you know, of course, this is a little facetious, but essentially, one thing that's worth doing is to talk a little bit about exactly what's going on inside of your eyes so that we understand how to most effectively create display technology that is going to be aligned to your human visual system. In fact, we'll see that when we use RGB to represent color, as we've done many times in this course, implicitly, we're actually making use of an anatomical observation about the human eye. Uh, in fact, you know, an RGB display is roughly optimized for the way that your eye works as a sensor. Um, but if you were some other species of animal, then uh, essentially, 
we might have to adjust from RGB to some other set of primaries. We'll talk about that in a minute. So here's a schematic of your eye. And continuing, uh, you know, from our previous slide here, let's see what happens to that path of light energy as it passes through your eye all the way to the sensor. So again, it started at the light source, bounced off of an apple and off of that guy's gold chain, <laughs> and now it's coming into your eye <laughs> uh, and we're sensing it. So here is roughly the path that the uh, light takes. Now, the first thing that happens is it passes through a fixed focus lens on the outside of your eye, known as the cornea, and then through an adjustable opening known as the pupil and the iris. Now, these two things uh, essentially form that cool-looking visual uh, part of your eye that actually is identifiable, uh, that, that we can see, associate with the uh, outside of your eyeball here. But Really what's going on is that these devices together are adjusting to open and close so that you can control the amount of light going into your eye, right? If you're in a dark room, then maybe your eye opens up so that it can collect more light uh, photons. But if your eye is open really, really wide and you're in a really bright environment, then you might get an overwhelming number of photons going in that just blow out your sensors. And so that's what the uh, pupil and the iris are taking care of. Next, the light passes through an adjustable lens. This allows you to do some focusing uh, based on depth, just with a single eye. This is the crystalline lens. Then through the vitreous humor, which is basically just a bunch of goo in the inside of your eye. Um, many of us, including your instructor, suffer from this thing called a floater, right? Which is basically just a little piece of detritus floating around in your vitreous humor and can get in the way of your eye, uh, your visual content every once in a while. And then finally, the light, which has come from the light source, bounced off the apple, gone through your cornea and your pupil, through the crystalline lens, the vit vitreous humor, runs into something called the retina which is basically the photo reception, re receptor in your eye, which is communicating with your brain through the optic nerve. So at the end of the day, the mechanism that we see here is essentially one for converting light signals to chemical ones, right? What comes into your eye is light energy, and what comes out is a chemical impulse that goes to your brain for processing. So, what we really need to do is to understand that interface. What's going on on that retina and how is that signal being converted? Because that's gonna tell us something about how we can produce effective displays. In particular, what's going on in that part of your eye is really two things. Uh, it, it's composed, at least roughly, of two different anatomical features, both of which are really critical for vision. Those two objects are rods and cones. Now, rods are parts of your object that are largely sensitive to light energy, just is light bright or is light not bright? <clears throat> uh, these often are used for low light vision, um, it is, where maybe color isn't the really important signal, but just the presence or absence of something in front of you. And then in high light vision, we additionally have cones in our eyes, which are sensitive to color. This species of vision is called photopic vision, as opposed to scotopic vision, which is for this, you know, insensitive to color, just light energy style of vision. So rods are sensitive to light energy, cones are sensitive to color, and these are the two types of sensors that our eye has uh, for sensing uh, light. In general, you have more rods than you have cones, and you can think of your rods as being relatively slow response, whereas your cones are relatively fast response. So, you know, if we think about it, essentially what's going on here is that your rods are these very blunt instruments in your eye. They work even when you're walking around in the dark and they just give you an idea of what's going on in a scene. Whereas your cones are what's giving you all that additional detail uh, and really are giving you additional information just uh, for focusing on a scene beyond uh, that, uh, you know, initial maybe impression. Now already 
Our lecture today is going to focus just on some practical, very rough aspects of how we might leverage information about our visual system to make for better computer graphics technology. And we can already do that starting now. So one conclusion that you might make from this in particular is that we have more rods than we have cones. That is to say that our eyes are more sensitive to changes in brightness than they are sensitive to changes in color. And so, in fact, if you want to compress a photograph, here's one sneaky trick that people can use um, and actually does get used in image processing in practice, uh, which is to compress the color content of your image more than the brightness content. And in fact, it's not just compression. So let's say that I want to come up with a really complicated Instagram filter that, you know, blurs out my photo and does something else kind of weird to it. One thing I can do to shave off two thirds of the computation is just apply my Instagram filter to the uh, intensity values, like the brightnesses in my image, and then leave the color signal alone. Actually, don't edit that at all. An example of what that looks like is actually shown on this image here. So here um, I'm showing an example of a pretty expensive image filtering operation that takes in a photograph and blurs it while attempting to preserve the edges. So we took a detailed photo of a tractor, um, blurred it out, but in a way where like you can see the sharp edges of the tractor wheels, but then the interiors of the wheels are blurry. This is a computationally expensive procedure. We're not going to go into the details of exactly how it's done. But one thing that you might notice if you zoom really, really closely into the pixels, right? So for example, if you look on the right hand side here, is that there actually are high frequency variations in the color of the image. By the way, that zoom is grabbed from this little square here. And what's going on is the, in order to produce this blurred out image, what I did is I converted the image to a representation where there are two channels of color and one channel of brightness, HSV as an example of that. And I only filtered the brightness channel. I just left the color alone. So if you look really, really closely at these pixels here, you'll see that the colors are actually changing pretty rapidly. They didn't get smoothed out. But we still perceive this as a smoothed out image because really the main signal that our eye gets is just the brightness. So I saved two thirds of my computation by only applying my filter to one channel instead of three. Sneaky trick, huh? So let's talk a little bit more about your rods and your cones. One thing that's worth knowing is that they're actually distributed in your eye in a particular way. Um, now, there's all kinds of cool observations that you can make about the distribution of rods and cones. Very roughly, uh, the rods are in the periphery part of your vision, right? You can see that in this plot here. So here are the uh, rods. And then the cones occupy this relatively small peak in the interior of the uh, eye. In fact, one particularly scary thing, um, you know, at some point your eye actually has to connect to the nerve and all that crazy stuff. There's actually a small blind spot in your vision where there are no sensors at all. So what does that mean? That means that depending on where light comes into your eye, it might hit into a rod or a cone and get sensed in a different way. And this can actually lead to some interesting implications for display technology that creative people have thought about over the years in order to save computation or more accurately put computation where it matters, right? If I'm spending a ton of my computation producing color in a part of an image where my eye is just not going to see it, maybe that computation will be better spent doing something else. So in fact, um, one of the kind of fun ideas that's been around forever is that of an attentive display that attempts to focus computation just on the location of your gaze or essentially where your eyes are pointing. And there's some really interesting perceptual studies that show that you might not even notice some blurry aspects of an image that are happening outside of that part of your visual field. Unfortunately, the uh, engineering of these sorts of attentive displays is extremely difficult. And I think that's really why they've been left mostly in the past. Um, in particular, we have to be able to track your eye 
at this extremely rapid rate in order to stay one step ahead of your gaze and your focus so that you don't end up with one of these frustrating displays, kind of like old school virtual reality where you change the direction of your gaze and then a second later, <laughs> the camera moves with you. Um, and, and, and so in order to get rid of that latency, you would need really, really high quality, essentially computer vision and or hardware equipment uh, to pull it off. And I don't think it's, it's typically something that we know how to do in practice. But in any event, it's a really interesting and intriguing idea, and it's one that's worth thinking about. So let's dig in even deeper into our color perception and talk about the different types of cones. Now remember that cones are your color sensors in your eyes. And in fact, we can differentiate cones into th typically three different categories. There's some people that are special and I believe can have four, but I don't know a whole lot about them. Uh, and these are labeled S, M, and L. That stands for short, medium, and long, which essentially involves the wavelength of light to which these cones are the most sensitive, right? So the uh, short uh, wavelength cone here, it's sensitive largely in the four to 500 nanometer. The medium wavelength occupies a pretty wide range uh, from five to 600, as does the long wavelength one, although it's biased more to the right. In fact, one thing to notice that's really, really critical here is that your three types of cones overlap a lot in their sensitivity. Um, so what does that mean? That means, for example, if I shine a, I don't know, 550 nanometer light on my eye, both the medium and the long cones are going to get excited. Uh, so it's not true that like, you know, there's that many colors that only target one of these three different cone types. In fact, your cones are laid out in sort of a mosaic pattern on your eye. Um, I think this is actually mostly an extraction. I'm sure that it's pretty much random in practice. But the, uh, the key piece of information here is that there's different numbers of different types of cones. Uh, in particular, there's sort of a uh, ratio here of roughly 150 long wavelength cones to 100 medium to one small. Now, that doesn't mean that we perceive color in that ratio. Otherwise, we'd be walking around and the world would look very red. <laughs> um, but rather, our eye uh, actually will amplify the missing signal that happens uh, in some wavelengths that we're less, uh, we're less sensitive to. In fact, if you look really closely at this diagram, you'll also see that the way that they're laid out um, is not entirely spatially uniform. Different parts of your visual field might be uh, more or less sensitive to different wavelengths of light. Now, there are many different fun visual science experiments that you can do to uh, notice this structure inside of your eye. One of the main ones that I recommend, the next time that you're sitting in the passenger seat of a car that's driving at night, you know, don't do this while you're driving, of course, is as follows. So let's say that I'm drawing, driving along a highway and I take a look at the different neon signs that are on the side of the road. One thing that is really starkly true for me at least, uh, I don't know, I've been sharing this example for years, so hopefully it's true for all of you as well, is that when you read the neon signs on the side of the road at night, some of them look really clear and some of them look really fuzzy. Why is that? Well, one example of a logo that always looks really fuzzy to me is Walmart, <laughs> which is in blue text, whereas other ones, uh, which are in red text, actually look perfectly clear, right? So for instance, this motel sign that you see on the computer screen here, um, the blue swallow text may actually not look so clear to your eye, whereas the red word motel may look very clear. Now, what's going on? Well, if you recall, your eye has this mosaic of cones that are spread out in kind of a funny ratio, right? You have a ton of cones that are sensitive to red light and very few that are sensitive to blue light. So when we take a look at signs like this motel sign here, 
what's going on is the the red light that's coming from the uh, red part of the sign is being really clearly sensed because you have a ton of cones that are sensitive to that wavelength of light. <coughs> On the other hand, you have far fewer cones that are sensitive to blue light. And so even though your brain is trying to fill in the missing detail, it ends up looking blurry to your eye. So anyway, just one fun uh, practical takeaway here. I would say if you're designing a logo for your company, Personally, I would aim for it to be in the uh, red part of the spectrum, especially if you expect it to be visible from a highway at night. <coughs> okay. So what's going on when we perceive light, and in particular when we perceive color, is really some combination of even more of this multiplication pattern that we've already identified when we talked about color before. As shown on a previous slide, if we want to figure out how much a spectrum of light is going to affect one of our cones, we can do so with a pretty straightforward computation. The first thing that we do is we have a sensitivity curve, which is telling us the sensitivity of either our short, medium, or long cone. So for example here, I think we have the medium cone, we can see that it's largely sensitive to wavelengths of light that are in the greenish range here. And we can think of this as a function of wavelength. Next, we get the power distribution of the light that's coming into your eye. So here we have orange light. You can see that because it's largely peaked in the orange range. If we want to see how much our cone is going to get excited by this particular power distribution, what we can do is take these two functions, multiply them by each other, and then integrate them along the uh, way of different wavelengths. This is just like when we talked in our Fourier and anti-aliasing lecture about how to figure out how much of one function is inside of one of the cosines or sines, but now we're taking the dot product between the sensitivity and the power distribution, measuring essentially how much they overlap. So in this case, the main contributor to the integral will probably be this region here, which is essentially going to be the part of the light energy which is stimulating the cone. So what does that mean at the end of the day? What that means is that if we want to figure out what our eye is perceiving as color, well, we take the power distribution of the light that's coming into the eye, Remember that that's already accounting for the material, like the material of the apple, as well as the light source, uh, the light source's power distribution itself. And we'll call that function phi of lambda. Oops. Now we'll multiply that function by the sensitivity of the cone that we're trying to analyze, like the long, medium, or short. We'll integrate, the, we get, we'll integrate those values against each other, those functions rather. And what we get is three numbers, L, M, and S. And what are those three numbers? That's just the amount that our light, represented by this function phi of lambda, excites the long, medium, and short cones. So at the end of the day, that's really what we perceive as color. We did it. <laughs> so to reiterate, this function phi here accounts for the color of the light after it bounces off the material of an object. Then you integrate it against the sensitivity of your three different types of cones as functions of lambda, and that gives you three numbers. Now, there are many different interpretations of those numbers. Another one is that they're kind of like a dot product, right? So if you think of your observed spectrum as kind of like a column vector here, then, uh, you know, your eye has these three spectral responses for short, medium, and long wavelengths. And really what you're observing when you want to figure out the response of your cone is the dot product between your short cone, medium cone, and long cone spectral response vectors and the spectrum vector uh, shown up here. Okay, so that is the process of how light gets sensed by your eye.
It's basically a distributional quantity until it gets into the inside of your eye, where it gets converted from a distribution over all possible wavelengths to just three numbers, S, M, and L, by just taking a dot product. Now, there's a corollary here, which I think we all know intuitively and we've talked about before, but maybe we haven't called it out for what it is, which is most disappointing <laughs> if we think too hard. Uh, and the corollary is that even though there's an infinite number of different wavelengths of light out there, so there's like an infinite number of different colors and types of light out there in the world, we actually only see three numbers. <laughs> and those three numbers are essentially just three integrals of the distribution of light against three very specific functions, those L, M, and S functions that we saw in previous slides. So we start with an infinite dimensional universe of different possible colors, and we end up with three numbers, just like a projection. So what does that mean? Well, for one, those three numbers are gonna be incredibly important when we talk about how we sense, store, and represent color on a computer. And we call those three integrals the tri-stimulus values for pretty obvious reasons. There's three of them <laughs> and there are three stimuli. Um, another kind of corollary of this procedure that we've talked about is that cones are not single wavelength detectors, right? We often use this shorthand, like, you know, your, you have your red cone, your green cone, and your, green, and your blue cone. But the reality is that each one of those is sensitive to different distributions of light energy, not just single wavelengths. And that's a good thing, right? Because otherwise your vision would have a lot of gaps between the different wavelengths. Now, let's remember a tiny bit of linear algebra yet again in 6837. It's basically unavoidable. Now, in particular, think about dimensionality here. Now, Initially, light can be described as this energy function. For every single wavelength, there's a different energy value associated to that wavelength, which is telling you the color of the light as the power as a function of wavelength. But then your eye only can actually sense three numbers, right? The integral of that function against L, M, and S. What does that mean? Well, we're taking a very high dimensional space and we're projecting it down to a very low dimensional space. Typically, when we do that, what happens? Well, we end up with a bunch of points that get projected down to the same location. So in our language, what does that mean? That means that there's a lot of different distributions of color out there in the universe that give us the same three tri-stimulus values. And those colors are known as metamers. So metamers are spectral compositions that create the same tri-stimulus values. So even though the light energy distributions might be different, they happen to excite our short, medium, and long cones the same way. And so our visual system is unable to distinguish between them. That's gonna be really critical. In particular, one thing that I think we all know is that our computer displays typically only produce maybe three wavelengths of light, typically some shade of red, some shade of green, and some shade of blue. Well, what's going on there? Well, I just spent all of this time trying to convince you that light is more complicated than three numbers. Those three numbers are just the three things that your eye senses. They're not actually the full level of computation of light energy out there in the universe. So really, when our display is producing red, green, and blue colors from fixed wavelengths, by the way, what's going on is that we're just trying to stimulate your long, medium, and short cones in a fashion that's similar, if not identical, to the way that a color that we're trying to reproduce would do so in the wild. Does that mean that the color, or rather the, um, the light energy that's coming off of your computer monitor is identical? to the light energy that would come into your eye if you observed you know, the scene that led to a photograph we're displaying rather than just the photograph itself? No, absolutely not. Your, your screen is not simulating all of that light energy. It's just producing you know, red, green, and blue colors 
so that your eye can't tell the difference. <laughs> I think that's really important. I think sometimes we think of our computer monitors as these totally non human devices. They're just these things that produce light. But the reality is that basically from their basic assumptions, they're engineered specifically for the human visual system and that we're taking advantage of metamerism in order to make the right kind of a display. Now, there's all kinds of fun details about metamerism that are fun to uh, talk about. Um, one, which is uh, a really important thing when you're shopping for clothing, is that metamers under one light source might not be metamers under a different light source. Remember, that makes sense because the light source gets multiplied by the uh, reflectance distribution Oh, um, of a particular material. So it could be that two different materials look the same under one light when you do that product and they look different with a different light. What does that mean? That means sometimes you have clothing that can appear to match in a store, uh, like under some neon light, especially neon light because it's got a very peaky power uh, spectrum, but then they don't actually look like they match when you go into the outdoors. So context actually matters for color perception. In fact, your brain is wired to assume certain contexts when we look at different images. Uh, and of course, this uh, has led to this famous internet controversy um, as to uh, whether or not this dress on the left-hand side is what black and blue or white and gold. I personally really struggle to <laughs> talk about this particular example because to me, it would be just crazy to interpret this image as white and gold. I can stare at it all day and, and just not see it. So I, I have no idea how you crazy people out there uh, that, that see this uh, dress as white and gold um, are perceiving it that way. But in any event, the, uh, the reason this crazy uh, f image made such a weird phenomenon is that the context for the color is really unclear in this photograph. And so depending on how you interpret the way the light is bouncing off the dress, you might either interpret it as blue and black or as white and gold. We should probably pause and set up a survey or something on our course Piazza page while I'm thinking of it. Okay, so what's our big picture here? As with just about every topic in 6837, at the end of the day, our color perception is nothing more than more linear algebra. Hopefully you all see that. Essentially, if we want to follow our story all the way through, we have a power spectrum of our light source. We have the reflectance spectrum of our material. Those two get multiplied together to create a stimulus, which is the spectrum of light energy that goes into our eye. Now, our eye, when we're trying to perceive color, really, we have three different color receptors, um, or types of color receptors, um, which are the three different types of cones shown in this third row here. So what happens? You take these three functions, multiply them against our stimulus function, and integrate, and that is what gives you the three tri-stimulus values. We can think of this like projecting onto a basis. Essentially, the basis here are these three, uh, uh, oops. The, yeah, these three sensitivity, uh, sensitivity curves here. This is like basis projection. But there's a problem. For one, it's an infinite dimensional problem. We started out with light as a function, uh, but there are two additional features that I think distinguish these examples from some of the other linear algebra that we've seen in 6837. In particular, our basis, right, like those three functions for short, medium, and long, are not orthogonal to one another. Moreover, light is always a positive function. We're going to see that that'll have a, a difference on our computation in a minute. Of course, this system can go wrong. Um, so, for example, well, I guess I shouldn't use the word wrong, but it can be different in, in, in different uh, individuals. So one common thing is colorblindness. Uh, so in colorblindness, maybe you're missing some type of cone, uh, one or more, and that makes it impossible to distinguish certain spectra. Um, so some common uh, examples of uh, colorblindness are given on the, uh, the, the screen here. 
the really interesting ones are you know anomalous trichromats which essentially maybe are sensitive to shifted uh spectra rather than just missing uh, one of the uh, sensors uh, if you're looking to carry out color blindness tests there are some really clever tests that date back uh, before computer technology i believe where essentially you can <clears throat> put a pattern inside of a, a pattern of dots of different colors so that the pattern is maybe indistinguishable if you're colorblind um, and visible if you uh, have full color sensitivity or in fact, um, there's one really clever uh, color blindness test where there's essentially a maze with maybe really subtle contrast and intensity um, and then lots of contrasting color. And what happens if you're colorblind is that, uh, well, then you can see the, ch uh, the, the contrast and sensitivity much more easily. Uh, and you can see this little path hiding here, which might be very difficult to see otherwise. Here's another fun example of a uh, painting that was created by uh, Marion, uh, who is a colorblind painter. Uh, and in fact, <clears throat> you can see uh, one really kind of fun example where, you know, essentially his notion of color uh, is really tied up with the, uh, the human visual system, uh, having in his case a, a bit of a colorblind uh, issue. Um, so, for example, the sky here is both red and blue, which would be kind of uncommon for uh, somebody with full color sensitivity. Okay, so in any event, let's now return to our color production story and switch to technology. Now, so far, we've talked about the ways that your eyes are sensitive to color, and that's led us to define these tristimulus values. But now maybe we want to make a display that can reproduce colors uh, to be seen by humans. Now, there's one really good piece of news for people that engineer color displays. And that's that we don't need every single pixel <laughs> to create the full spectrum of different color energies. In particular, well, we only have to match colors up to metamerism meaning that we only really have to figure out how to make every pixel on our display uh, activate your short, medium, and long cones in the correct fashion. We're going to focus today on additive color synthesis, which are like computer screens. This is different from subtractive color uh, synthesis, which is done using ink. And in particular, just like in your computer display, we'll use three primaries, like red, green, and blue. And our goal is to match all of the different visible colors, or at least as many of them as possible, using just those three wavelengths of light. So the question that we want to ask is, let's say that I have a particular shade of color that I want to produce on my computer screen. How much should I light up the red, green, and blue pixels to reproduce that target color as a sensation in my eye. Now, unfortunately, this is actually a bit tricky. Now, what we're gonna see is that <clears throat> the response curves for sensing color and the response curves for producing colors are actually not the same, and that there's good reason for this. In particular, here's an incorrect way <laughs> that I might attempt in a first shot at producing a given tri-stimulus value in my eye. So let's say that I have a particular wavelength of light that I'd like to reproduce. So maybe I have a really pure purple light, magenta here, that I'm trying to reproduce in my display. And my display only knows how to produce three different primaries that are roughly similar to the short, medium, and long response curves. So the first thing that I might do is measure the sensitivity of <clears throat> my three different types of cones to this particular wavelength of light. Now, in this case, notice that this color only overlaps with the short wavelength cone. And in fact, maybe we get tristimulus values that look like 0.500 for short, medium, and long. So in other words, my medium and long cones are not activated at all when I see this particular wavelength of light. 
So here's the, an incorrect way to do additive color synthesis. I'm gonna circle wrong here in case you're looking at the slides later, which would be maybe I make a, uh, <clears throat> a light bulb whose distribution of light is identical to this curve here for the uh, short cone. <clears throat> And, well, remember that my tri-stimulus values were 0 0.5, 0, and 0. So I just take this short cone light source, I scale it to 0.5 intensity, and I hope that the color that I get out is correct. And unfortunately, that actually doesn't happen. So this shaded blue curve here is the uh, color that would be produced. But notice that there's overlap with the medium and long cones. So what went wrong? Well, notice that when I sensed it, now the medium and long cones got some excitement and I perceived the color differently. The reason is that these three response curves are not orthogonal to one another. They can overlap and actually pollute one another. So when we do our measurement of how much a given light source excites our short, medium, and long cones, we can't just use that number to produce a display and hope that it produces the right signal. In fact, that's really gonna get accentuated because of the large amount of overlap between the medium and long cones here. And so these are fundamental problems. Our spectra are infinite dimensional. We can only turn on light. We can't like use a negative amount of light but the response curves for our cones overlap and are not orthogonal. So one thing that we could try to do would be to directly measure cone sensitivity. So for example, what we might do is go through every wavelength of light and for each one, try to come up with some electronic device that actually takes somebody's cones and physiologically measures how much they get excited. So now we just have a lookup table that we can invert when we try to reproduce a particular color on the screen. But of course, as an anatomical <laughs> experiment, that's a particularly challenging one to carry out. And it certainly was not available uh, when color spaces were invented around the 1920s. So instead, some folks in France were much more clever than that. And they came up with an experiment that involved trying to match a given input color by controlling three knobs. Those experiments look something like this. So here, for each wavelength of light, we would make a light bulb that displays just that single wavelength. Now, the uh, person in the experiment is given three different knobs that can control the intensity of a blue light, a green light, and a red light of a particular fixed frequency, or uh, well, frequency, wavelength, whatever. And then those lights are combined until the person viewing the combination of these three fundamental wavelengths perceives it as being identical to the color of the light that they're trying to match. In particular, uh, CIE, oops, settled on um, three fundamental wavelengths uh, for red, green, and blue that are 700 uh, nanometers, 546.1 nanometers, and 435.8 nanometers. And these were chosen, chosen heuristically uh, because essentially they covered the most choices of wavelength for this light on the right-hand side among uh, some of the different choices. So essentially, what does this give us? Well, it gives us an interesting table, which says for each wavelength of light, like that orange light on the right-hand side, what should be the amount that I should turn on the red, green, and blue lights to imitate that color value? In, order, in other words, to get the same tri-stimulus effect. So if we go through that experiment for every possible wavelength, what we end up with is a plot something like this. So for example, let's say that uh, I want to make 600 nanometer light, or I want to simulate that using my red, green, and blue lights. Well, then this tells us that we shouldn't turn on the blue light, for one thing, <laughs> uh, and that we should do roughly, what, 50% green and 100% and red or something like that. Now, 
If we look at this plot too closely, uh, we'll notice that, of course, something went a little bit wrong. <laughs> and that is that it's telling us to use a negative amount of red. Now, in practice, this makes sense, um, from a linear algebra perspective at least, because essentially we have three basis vectors, right? Red, green, and blue are sort of taking place as a basis vector. And now for every point in our space, we're trying to write it as a linear combination of these three bases. There's no reason why that linear combination has to have positive weights. Linear algebra doesn't tell you anything about the sign of your coefficient. In practice, what happened was that some colors could not be produced by only turning on lights. So instead, um, in the CIE experiment, what they had to do was to add white on the other side to the, uh, the other piece of the experiment. What does that mean in practice? That means that these wavelengths are not perfectly reproducible using these CIE RGB primaries uh, unless you can do something subtractive. So instead, if we want to fake it at those particular wavelengths, what we might do instead is kind of wash our color out by just raising the amount of red and green, um, or rather green and blue. Uh, but in order to do that, we've essentially changed the color somewhat. Okay, so here's our recap so far. The spectrum of light energy is this infinite dimensional object, but it gets produced uh, or rather, it gets projected down into three spectral responses in the cones in your eye. What that means is that a lot of different colors are metamers, meaning that we perceive them to be the same, even though their spectrum of light energy is quite different. So in the CIE color system, essentially what happened is they agreed on these three primary wavelengths of light because they covered most of the interesting colors out there. And then you made these tri-stimulus curves where for every wavelength, people turn knobs to control the relative amount of those three primaries until they match that wavelength. Uh, and, and that's what gives you the curves that you saw. Unfortunately, in some cases, you ended up with negative values. So we had to simulate doing subtractive color by kind of removing it from the other source. Now, this is already our first example of a display where certain colors are just not possible. Like just by turning on the CIE three primary colors, there's some colors that we can see and other ones that are not. So in general, this uh, leads us to a notion called the gamut of a display, which is the set of colors that are representable using a particular display dis device or color space. So here um, is a very typical diagram for visualizing uh, what this is. So uh, CIE leads to color measurements um, that can be written in different uh, spaces. So a typical set of three values is X, Y, and Z for your uh, uh, tristimulus values. But a very typical thing to do is to take your tristimulus values and divide out their sum. This is roughly like luminance, like brightness. And what you're left with is just a two-dimensional expression of color, which is useful because, I don't know, we like to make two-dimensional plots. And that leads us to this diagram uh, known as the chromaticity diagram, like what you're seeing on the screen here. Um, so here is like some region, which are all of the colors that are producible with a given display uh, after dividing out the luminance. So for example, the CIE primaries form a triangle in color space. And essentially, uh, red, green, and blue are the vertices of this triangle. Uh, and then a display, which is combining those three pure wavelengths of light, can achieve any of the colors that are inside of the triangle formed by those three points. And that negative light phenomenon that we talked about before is essentially happening outside of that triangle. Notice the commonalities with barycentric coordinates. <coughs> this is a pretty wide variety of colors. Um, so in general, this horseshoe shape is supposed to represent the full gamut of visible color. Of course, this is a bit of a lie on this particular display because we're all viewing this visualization on our computer screens, which does not have a full gamut. Um, which makes it difficult for us to talk about it in this course, but that's okay.
So when we talk about different display technologies, one thing that we can do is visualize the amount of color that's visible on that type of display as some region on this horseshoe worth of visible light colors. So for example, um, here is an HDTV. You can see it's contained within the CIE uh, primaries, but it has a pretty wide gamut of colors. Or here's the uh, gamut of colors that are achievable using crayons. <laughs> Obviously, this is just a discrete set of points. Now, these diagrams will look different in different color spaces. Essentially, the one that we've introduced so far is the CIE XYZ color space, which are those three chromaticity values that are like the three knobs that we use to turn on and off the CIE primaries. But there are other ones out there that can be useful as well. So for example, the LAB color space is luminance plus, well, A and B, <laughs> where luminance is, is you know, kind of like brightness, and then A and B were designed to be perceptually uniform. So in other words, what they wanted in the LAB color space was not to just measure tristimulus values or how much I should turn on and off primaries, but rather to make it so that distances in AB space roughly measure distances in perception, like close by points will correspond to colors that your brain perceives as close by. Another color space, which appears quite a bit in practice is HSV, which stands for hue, saturation, and value. Sometimes values replaced with luminance. So in this particular color space, it was designed you know, somehow with artists in mind to be more intuitive, um, where, you know, S is saturation. So like a desaturated colors like white and black are in the center. Uh, and as you move further out, you get this color. Um, uh, the value is going from black to color. And then finally, the hue is mapped to a circle, um, which is taking color of red versus green versus blue. Speaking of color spaces, it is worth mentioning that there is subtractive color out there in the universe, <coughs> which is used um, in pigmentation and in ink. So in subtractive color, we remove color starting from white rather than adding color starting from black or absence of light. So uh, the typical application of subtractive color, of course, is in printing where we start with a white sheet of paper and when we add ink, well, the ink is basically, you know, a chemical which is absorbing different uh, light energies. Much of the math for subtractive color is similar to what we've talked about here, but just kind of flipped backward from the additive case. So for example, rather than having RG and B primaries, you end up with cyan, magenta, and yellow. The basic idea here is that your primary should be combinations of two colors because, or another way to put it is that your primaries only remove one of those three tristimulus values. Incidentally, typically we talk about that color space as CMYK, where you have cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. The reason is that people found that black is a very particularly important color when it comes to printing and other applications, so it makes sense to include it as its own primary. Uh, your eye is really sensitive to intensity changes, as we've already talked about. So having a dedicated ink, which is controlling that, namely your black ink, made a lot of sense rather than like simulating the color black by dripping tons of color that can bleed into one another of three different other primaries. What that means is that CMYK colors are actually non-unique. Uh, so a very typical thing to do is rather than express a color using no black at all, um, maybe to use the maximum amount of black possible for each color in the image, and then use C, M, and Y uh, to make up the difference. Uh, this makes sense for a lot of reasons. Color ink is maybe more expensive than the black and white ink, and the black and white ink uh, is really what's controlling a lot of the image quality here. So in summary, all this color space stuff is just about linear algebra. We're projecting from an infinite dimensional spectrum to a three-dimensional color response in your eye. And then all of these different color spaces are just linear or in some cases, nonlinear changes of basis. Usually they can be converted by three by three matrices.
And these different systems are complicated because you're projecting from infinite dimensional spaces to finite dimensional ones. You're working with non-orthogonal bases, right? That's like the overlap in your different cones and you can't have negative light. So probably the most standard color space is the CIE XYZ system that we discussed. So that's roughly just the amount that you turn on those three CIE primaries to match different colors. And roughly this just corresponds to one flavor of RGB, but there are many others. Now to conclude our lecture today, we're gonna to mention just a, a, a bit more about one uh, representational issue for color. And again, this is going to take advantage of and really depend on the human visual system. And that is the fact that your visual system is more sensitive to ratios uh, than it is to absolute values in color and intensity. Now, if we use a linear encoding, that's basically just turning on the electricity going into your display. What that means is that we'll have lots of information in some parts of our uh, linear encoding and very little information in between others. And why is that? Well, again, remember that we're sensitive to ratios. So if a pixel has one unit of intensity versus two, that's sort of perceived in a similar fashion to the difference between 128 and 255 units of intensities. So there's like, 128 shades of color in between these two points, but only one shade of color in between these two if we're using integers between 0 and 255 to represent a color. So in other words, in some sense, the range over here is wasted a little bit because we end up with very low resolution images when they have lots of colors close to zero, very high resolution images when they have lots of colors close to a very bright shade. So what do we do? Well, essentially we want to use some kind of a logarithmic encoding, you know, one where we have evenly spaced, even spaces in our encoding correspond to evenly spaced differences in perceived intensity. Now log might be a reasonable function to use to kind of run our intensity values through before storing color, but log has an asymptote at zero. So that's not too good. So instead, we typically use a system called gamma encoding. In gamma encoding, we store a digital image not linearly in intensity or you know electricity that needs to go to the pixel to turn on or off uh, uh, the given color, but instead we store that value to some one over gamma power. And if we need linear values, for instance, for our display, then we can decode that on the fly. And so essentially the reason for using gamma encoding is that it allows us to store an image with equal amounts of resolution in the light and dark parts when it comes to resolution relative to your visual system rather than relative to just the color values that we want to store. So here is a visualization of what this looks like. So on the top, we take a linear ramp of intensity values and one thing that you can see uh, is that essentially there's lots of gradations in the light color and very few gradations in the dark. Whereas if we use a gamma value of 2.2, which is pretty common for, I think, Windows displays, then you can see that everything ends up being evenly spaced, which is what we want. So our message here is that digital images are typically gamma encoded often using gamma equals 2.2, but there is some disagreement there. Uh, and what that means is that essentially when you load up a JPEG file or some other image file, you better know whether it's gamma encoded or not, because that's going to affect the way that you display it. In other words, you have to decode the uh, gamma values before you actually show it on the screen. So as a quick recap today, we talked about different spectra of light energy and essentially how those affect color perception. So what happens of course, is that the light source has its own spectrum of color energy that interacts with the material that we're viewing in the universe that reflects off its own spectrum that goes into our eye and gets integrated against the short, medium and long cone response curves. And those are what we perceive.
Now, if we want to invert that function, just like we might invert a matrix, um, that's what's going to lead us to our display technology, which tells us how much to turn on three different primary colors of light. Well, when we do that, our goal is not to reproduce the spectrum that came into the eye exactly, but rather to produce a spectrum that is a metamer to the one that came in. And so in order to do that, well, we have these tri-stimulus curves, which tell us how to turn on three different basic primaries in order to match all the different colors. What we saw was that different displays, or equivalently different choices of primary colors, lead to different uh, gamuts that are visible without needing negative coefficients. And in fact, by the way, our color spaces don't have to just have three primaries. They could have 10, and that would actually increase the area inside of that horseshoe curve that we can see using our display. Finally, we talked about gamma encoding, which essentially says that we shouldn't store linear spacing in intensity, but rather should do something that looks more logarithmic in nature in order to account for the fact that our eye really views uh, color intensity and light intensity in a ratio fashion rather than just with linear changes. So in any event, this is just a coarse introduction to color perception and how your eye works. Obviously, there's so much more to it than that, uh, and I would encourage you all to take further coursework if you like these perceptual ideas to really learn how to come up with intelligent displays that know more about the human visual system. So with that, I'll see you next time.